Welcome back to this series of lecture on post-colonial literature. Today we will be uh, continuing with our discussion on decolonization from the Indian perspective and we will be doing so with special reference to the poetry of Henry Louis Vivian de Rosio. But before we start exploring the poems of de Rosio, let us dwell a little longer on the English educated middle class which emerged in India during the 19th century and the nationalist discourse that they forged. Now, as I have already uh, said in my previous lecture, that one of the characteristic features of uh, this nationalist discourse that the middle class came up with was an underlying cyclical pattern. And this uh, pattern looks something like this. Uh, this is already a known slide. I am using it from the previous lecture. And we can see that according to this pattern, India was once a land of high civilization, which represented its golden age. But the people of uh, this subcontinent uh, had subsequently fallen from that superior position and the golden age was now lost. So the present India therefore represented a kind of uh, a degenerate state of being which was confirmed by the fact that Indians had now become a colonized race who were subjugated by the Europeans. Now the present India as I said is an India of decay and degeneration but this pattern which talks about a fall from the golden age also talks about a regeneration. So the fall from the golden age of the past according to this pattern is to be remedied in the future which will be marked by a reversion back to the golden age. Now as I have said earlier if we study the development of the middle class nationalist discourse, we will observe various uh, differences regarding say for instance what constitutes this Indian golden age, when did it come to an end, what are the reasons for its uh, coming to an end and things like that. Uh, but the underlying cyclical pattern which you can see in this slide remained the same till say the Gandhian era of the 20th century. And as we shall see today, this cyclical pattern already started emerging quite early during the 19th century. So this pattern can clearly be traced in uh, the discourse of the middle class from as far back as the early 19th century down to the Gandhian era of the 20th century. And the text where this cyclical pattern of the Indian nationalist discourse is most explicitly evident is perhaps in the Bengali novel Anundamot written by the 19th century Bengali novelist Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay. Uh, Bonkim Chandra's dates are 1838 to 1894 and his career is typically that of an individual belonging to the new middle class, Indian middle class that started emerging from the 19th century. Indeed, uh, Bonkim, uh, typical of the middle class, he was also an English educated person and was in fact one of the first students to graduate from the Calcutta University, which was set up in 1857 along with the universities of uh, Bombay and Madras to promote western style education in India. Uh, Bonkim Chandra served the British go government first as a deputy collector and then as a deputy magistrate. And uh, near the end of his life, he was awarded by the colonial government with the title of CIE or the Companion of the Order of the Indian Empire. So in one sense, Bonkim Chandra was quite thoroughly integrated as part of the colonial authority. He was part of the colonial system itself. But this is only one side of his career, uh, which is in fact almost forgotten today. 
today Bong Kim Chondro is remembered uh, almost exclusively as one of the first, and here I quote the words of the historian Partho Chatterjee, he is remembered as, quote, one of the first systematic expounders in India of the principles of nationalism. And indeed his novel Anundamot can easily be regarded as one of the founding texts of Indian middle class nationalist discourse. And as most of us uh, will know, the song Vande Mataram, uh, which is contained in uh, this novel Anundamot, uh, was inextricably associated with the middle class led nationalist movement throughout the 20th century. And of course, later uh, in uh, independent India, it uh, became the national song. So, as I was saying, it is in this novel Anundamot that we most clearly encounter the cyclical pattern of a glorious past, a fall from it and a future promise of reverting back to it. Uh, in this novel which tells the story of uh, the Sanyasi rebellion that erupted in Bengal during the late 18th century, the hero Mohindro is at one point uh, in the novel shown three different images of the mother goddess by the sannyasis to explain to him the reason for which the rebellion was organized by them. And the three different images of mother goddess that Mohindra sees are variously described as, the first one is described as the mother as she was. The second one is described as the mother as she is at present. And the third one is a depiction of the mother as she will become or as she will be in the future. And each of these images, they represent in the novel different states of the country, India, in past, present and future. And the first which, which depicts the mother goddess as the resplendent Jagadhatri, perfectly formed and decorated with every ornament, represents the glorious past of India. The second depicting her as Kali, who has been robbed of everything, represents the state of misery which the country has fallen into in the present. And the third depicting her as Durga, glistening and smiling in the early morning rays, and these are words from the novel, holds out the promise of a future regeneration of the ancient glories. And it is for this future regeneration that the sannyasis are apparently working. Now, according to Bunkim Chandra, the transformation of the motherland from the first image, that of the resplendent Jagadhatri, to the second image, that of uh, Kali, who uh, has been robbed of everything, was manifested by the lack of independence. And uh, it was uh, the third image, therefore, was an attempt to regain back that resplendent earliest teacher, which the mother enjoyed. But an attempt to regain back the state of glory in the future, Bong Kim Chandra's novel seems to suggest, would require superhuman efforts by what is referred to as the Santans or the children of the motherland. But interestingly, if we read the novel through, we will realize that this effort to uh, relieve the mother of its present miseries and to uh, revert her back to the past glories is not an effort that is to be automatically directed against the British colonial rule. Now, this might sound somewhat counterintuitive to us today, but as a long monologue near the end of the novel argues, 
without the help of the colonial rule, the Hindus will not be able to regain their earlier glory, which was characterized by a way of life which is referred to in the novel as Sanatan Dharma. Now, here it is important to note that in Bonkim Chandra's writings, we find a problematic merging of terms like Indian, Hindu and Bengali. And uh, here also in the novel, there is this very problematic overlapping of these terms. And when we read Bonkim Chandra, we need uh, to uh, keep this in mind because the novelist uh, seems to use these terms almost as synonymous, though they are uh, evidently not. But coming back to the monologue, we find the monologue stating this. Unless the English rule, it will not be possible for the eternal code or the Sanatan Dharma to be reinstated. The true Hindu rule of life is based on knowledge, not on action. And this knowledge is of two kinds outward and inward. The inward knowledge is the chief part of the eternal code, Sanatan Dharma. But unless the outward knowledge arises first, the inward cannot arise. For a long time now, the outward knowledge has been lost in this land and so the true eternal code has been lost too. The English are very good in the outward knowledge and they are very good at instructing people. Therefore, we will make the English king. So, the argument in this section of the monologue is that though the subjugation of uh, the Indians slash Hindus by a foreign power is symptomatic of their fall from the golden age, colonial rule is nevertheless necessary to regain that position of power. This is because the western knowledge that the European colonizers bring with them is essential for the re-establishment of the Sanatan Dharma, which according to Bunkim at least uh, is the true Hindu slash Indian way of life. So, the colonial rule therefore, becomes the very means of overcoming the state of subjugation and the western knowledge system becomes the very template on which Bonkim scripts the discourse of decolonization. Therefore, in this early phase of nationalist discourse as encountered in the works of Bonkim Chandra for instance, we find a unique mixture. Uh, of respect towards the western civilization and western knowledge system uh, of the colonizer and an attempt to move towards a decolonized future when India will be restored to its past glory. We should remember this uh, unique composition of the nationalist discourse because later when we uh, will study the Gandhian discourse of the 20th century, uh, when we are doing Raja Rao's Kantapura, we will see that this early respect for the colonizer's civilization becomes one of the main targets of Gandhi's attack. Right? But today we will not proceed to Gandhi and the 20th century modification of this nationalist discourse. Rather, we are going to move back, we are going to go back to the early 19th century and see how the thought patterns that we have identified in Bonkim Chandra's nationalist discourse is found in a nascent state in the poetry of Henry Louis Vivian de Rosio. Now, de Rosio, whose image you can see here, was born in 1809 in Calcutta and he died at a rather young age in 1831. But in spite of uh, this uh, very short lifespan, de Rosio had a profound impact on the contemporary Indian society. Indeed, as a popular teacher in the Hindu College of Calcutta, which was incidentally the first uh, major institute of Western uh, higher learning to be set up anywhere in India. Uh, de Rosio is credited for introducing a whole generation of Indians to the merits of English education or Western style education. 
in that regard, de Rosio can be regarded as one of the founding fathers of the Indian middle class, which started emerging um, in India during the 19th century. But uh, today, de Rosio is best remembered for his poetry, which represents one of the earliest instances of the middle class attempt to forge a nationalist discourse in India. But interestingly, however, the body of poem through which de Rosio articulated his nationalist thoughts borrowed heavily from European literary traditions. And to understand this uh, melange of European literary traditions and Indian nationalist thought in de Rosio's work, let us look at this particular instance of his poetry. And uh, this particular poetry is titled, poem is titled, The Harp of India. Now, before we go on to the content of these 14 lines, I would like you to note that the form of the poem is that of a sonnet. Um, and the sonnet form is, of course, uh, well known as one of the main forms of poetry in European literature. And it had its origin in Italy uh, somewhere around the 13th century, but became very popular in England uh, from the 16th century onwards. And which is why uh, one of the tallest literary figures of uh, Britain at that point of time, William Shakespeare, is also known as a great sonneteer who produced more than 150 sonnets. Um, this sonnet tradition, which uh, originated in Italy and then moved to England, came to India uh, via the British literature. And uh, de Rosio was uh, one, of, one of the first Indian practitioners of uh, this sonnet form. So, though the sonnet tradition uh, was thoroughly indigenized later by poets like Michael Modushudan Dotto, who for instance produced sonnets in Bengali, uh, when de Rosio was writing during the first decades of the 19th century, sonnets were still considered primarily to be a European mode of poetic expression. Now, let us come to the inner dynamics of the sonnet form because as we will see, it directly influences the nationalistic content of uh, the poem Harp of India. So, the 14 lines of a sonnet and sonnets are usually composed of 14 lines are usually divided into two parts. The first eight lines form a separate segment by itself and is referred to as the octave and the last six lines form a separate segment which is referred to as sestate. So, octave and sestate and octave and sestate are uh, separated from one another uh, by uh, some differences in the rhyme scheme, but I will not be focusing on the rhyme difference in today's lecture. What I am going to focus on is the difference in the thought pattern which separates the octave and the sestate. So, uh, whatever actually, whatever thought is put forward in the first eight lines of a traditional sonnet, whatever thought is put forward in the octave is reversed in the sestate, a very different thought, a contradictory thought is put forward in the sestate. And this change between the octave and sestate, this reversal is technically referred to as the volta, V-O-L-T-A. Now, so this octave sestate separated by a volta was how the sonnet was divided in the conventional Italian form. But when it came to England, we see a slight change in the position of the volta. So, for instance, in many of Shakespeare's sonnets, we notice that the volta, rather than 
occurring at the beginning of the cestate is delayed till the very last two lines of the poem, where the central thought put forward by the first 12 lines are reversed. And when we focus on Derosio's Harp of India, it is important to keep in mind these two possible positions of the Volta, because as I will show, Derosio applies the Volta in both these places. So, and he does that in order to thematically divide the poem into three segments rather than two. So, we will discuss this uh, when uh, we come to the content and in fact, let us come to the content right now. If you read the first eight lines of this poem, The Harp of India, you will see Derosio is using a broken harp as a metaphoric representation of India. So, the first eight lines, it starts from why hangest thou lonely on yon withered bough and it continues till here. So, in these first eight lines, we see that Derosio is talking about a broken harp which is used as a metaphorical representation of the land of India and he is lamenting about its present state of decay. The harp whose music was once so sweet has now fallen into disrepair and as the poem says, quote, silence hath bound thee with her fatal chain. Now, please note that throughout this section of uh, the poem, De Rosio uses present tense, which signifies that this pitiable silence is representative of the present condition of the harp and by extension of India as a whole. Now, if you compare this to the first four lines of the cestate, uh, which starts with here, once thy harmonious chords to sweetness gave and which continues uh, till here, those hands are cold, you will uh, see that here the poem predominantly uses the past tense and it speaks of the glory that was associated with the harp slash India of the past. So, the volta that separates the octave from the cestate reverses the pitiable condition of the present by introducing us to how the harp was in the golden past. But if you note the last two lines or rather I should say the last two and a half lines because it starts from this, uh, these words, but if thy notes divine, which actually occurs in line number 12, we will see that here De Rosio introduces another volta and he introduces another temporal schema. So here the poem is speaking about the future in which the poet will try and restore the harp and by breaking its silence, make it sing again. It is this recovery and reversion back to the golden age that is indicated by the action stated in the last line, harp of my country, let me strike the strain and therefore break the chains of silence which has kept it under bondage and subjugation. So, you see that the cyclical pattern of a golden past followed by a fall and a present state of decay, giving way to a future course of action which will help revert back to the golden past is already identifiable in this poem by De Rosio. And uh, this cyclical pattern which was to become so prominent in the nationalist discourse of Bung Kim Chondro, for instance, later in the 19th century is found repeated in a number of sonnets by De Rosio. Uh, for instance, if you place De Rosio's poem to India, my native land, next to his uh, The Harp of India, you will find the same cyclical pattern in that sonnet also. But what is also important to note, especially with respect to The Harp of India, is the use of a western template to articulate Indian nationalist thought. This we have identified in the writings of Bong Kim Chandra. But here we see it foreshadowed in the poem of De Rosio, where the western form of a sonnet is used as a vehicle to present what might be regarded as a proto-nationalist discourse. In the next lecture, we will uh, see how this form of nationalist discourse 
which uh, was initiated by de Rosio and which finally flourished in the writings of Bong Kim Chondro during the late 19th century is transformed by M. K. Gandhi and how this transformation wrought by Gandhi finds its way in the novel of Raja Rao titled Kanthapura. We will do that in the next lecture. Thank you.